Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. This is Fiona at Drawings in a Drawer and this is a new series which is going to be called Art and Crime. Yes, that's quite an unusual combination I guess, but it's October, it's almost Halloween and to be honest with you, I'm obsessed with mysteries and solved cases and I love to listen to podcasts about them. So here goes my first case and this is the unsolved disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi, which took place here in the city where I live. Rome, and it's very possibly one of the greatest mysteries to ever have taken place in the Eternal City, and people still talk about it 37 years later. So while I paint Emanuela, I will try and tell you as much as I can about her, even though covering this whole case would take days, and there's only so much talking I can do, and so much listening you can do. Emanuela was a 15-year-old girl, the fourth of five kids. She was an average girl who had burning passion for music and especially for the transverse flute. However, Emanuela was different from most girls because she was a citizen of the Vatican City. In case you don't know, the Vatican City is where the Pope lives, where St. Peter's Basilica stands and the Vatican Museums and the world famous Sistine Chapel painted by Michelangelo are. It is the smallest sovereign state or country in the world by both area and population, with just under 900 inhabitants. And it is completely independent from Italy, even though it is positioned in the heart of Rome. It has its own army, its own license plates, its own stamps and passports. And of course, it is ruled by the Pope, who is also the Bishop of Rome and head of the Catholic Church. Emanuela was born on the 14th of January, 1968 the fourth daughter of Ercole and Maria Orlandi. Her father, Ercole, worked within the Vatican. He wasn't particularly high up in his position and their family was very normal. The children had access to the majestic Vatican gardens and lived in this apparently safe and happy cocoon without a care in the world. At the time of her disappearance on June 22nd, 1983, Emanuela had just finished the second year of high school or secondary school at the Liceo Scientifico which is basically just a secondary school, which focuses mostly on subjects like maths and science. As I mentioned, this 15-year-old girl's true passion was music. And even though the summer holidays had now begun, because we have three months of summer holidays in Italy, she still attended a music school three times a week in Piazza Santa Polinare, about a mile or so from the Vatican City where she lived. To get there, she always caught the number 64 bus, and then it was only the shortest walk to get to the music school. And the day of the, her disappearance was no different to any other day. Emanuela grabbed her flute, apparently had a slight quarrel with her younger brother Pietro, and left the flat to go catch bus number 64, like she did multiple times a week. Her music teacher reports she arrived to the lesson slightly late and was quite distracted. She even asked to leave the lesson 10 minutes early at 10 to 7 in the evening, which she did. After she left, she called her sister Federica and told her that on her way to the music lesson, she had been stopped by a man who had offered her her job selling Avon cosmetics or distributing Avon pamphlets adver advertising the cosmetics at a three hour long fashion show coming up that weekend. A job which would have earned her 350,000 lira, a very high sum for the time and something which could be compared to earning 500 euro now for just a three hour long job. Of course, something which would sound very appealing to a teenager, but also highly suspicious, as her sister Federica pointed out when Emanuela called home to ask for her parents' permission to accept the job. However, her parents were not in at the time. Two friends of Emanuela also saw her from the bus standing on the street corner, supposedly talking to a curly-haired girl with a man waiting in a nearby green BMW. The scene was also witnessed by a police officer and a traffic warden. One thing's for sure, the man in the green BMW could not have worked for Avon as it, is only it only employs women and anyway, Avon has denied there were any similar job positions going at the time. Anyway, Emanuela was supposed to meet another of her sisters at a nearby square at 7.30pm but she never showed up. Emanuela simply vanished into thin air. Her parents were quick to report her disappearance to the police, who initially believed Emanuela might have ran away or gone off with some friends, but her family knew this was not like Emanuela at all. And also, it was and is not very common thing for teenagers to run away from home in Italy, as it is a very family-centred culture, if that makes any sense. Let's say it's just not very common for that to happen, and I believe in the 80s it would have been even less common. 
Over the next few days, news of the disappearance was leaked to the media and the family's home number was published in the papers so that anyone with any information could call the family's house phone directly. Possibly not a very good idea, as the family started receiving a number of prank calls and false information and, of course, false hope, as you will imagine. On June the 25th, a man who claimed to be called Pierluigi called and said he had seen Emanuela selling cosmetics in Campo de Fiori, a popular meeting spot for young people and tourists in the historic centre of Rome. He said she went by the name of Barbara or Barbarella and that she was taking a break from her life at home but would return after the summer for her sister's wedding. The same story was given by another caller who also said that this Barbara girl, who according to him was actually Emanuela Orlandi, was selling cosmetics with a friend. However, the description he gave of Emanuela was wrong as when questioned he said Emanuela was tall, whereas Emanuela was very petite. It is now believed that these men purposefully gave out false information to take the investigation off track. And this is only the beginning of the twists and turns in this bizarre, absurd case. Almost immediately, the Secret Services got involved and put a tracking device on their Orlandi's phone to record any calls they got. That's why we have the recording of the calls I mentioned earlier and which you can find yourself on YouTube. The Secret Services, and in particular an agent called Giulio Ganji, started following the trail of the green BMW. Ganji started following the trail of the green BMW and found out that one had recently been fixed at a nearby garage, as one of its front windows had apparently been smashed from the inside, as if someone had been trying to escape from the vehicle. This was a really strong lead and Ganji followed it up, but it was not long after that he was taken off the case and demoted to a desk job in an office. Why? No one really knows. The Orlandis were by no means a rich family. They could not count on anything other than Hercules' wages, so it was clear that Emanuela had not been abducted to request a ransom from the family. So where was she and what had happened to her? On July the 3rd, Pope John Paul II himself makes a public statement about the missing girl during his weekly Sunday public prayer in St Peter's Square inside the Vatican. This is something the Pope always does on Sundays and has only recently been interrupted due to Covid restrictions. However, the Pope said he was close to Emanuela's family and prayed for her speedy return. Over the next few months, John Paul II made seven more statements about Emanuela, making the matter very personal to him, as one of the Vatican's own citizens had gone missing. This brought the case to global attention. Suddenly everyone knew about the disappearance of the girl who the Pope himself was talking about. But was this a good idea? Yet again, possibly not. It wasn't very wise because now that the Pope was involved, anyone who had any interests or wanted something from the Catholic Church could claim they knew something or that they were involved with the possible abduction of the 15-year-old to get something in return, to have leverage. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. Shortly after, the Orlandis started receiving calls from a man who would later be dubbed the American due to his accent. This man claimed the Grey Wolves, a Turkish terrorist organisation, had Emanuela and that they would free her in exchange for the release of Mehmet Ali Agka, a Turkish terrorist who had tried to kill the Pope in May 1981 by shooting him four times and wounding him with two bullets during a public appearance in St Peter's Square. Ali Agka had been caught and sentenced to life in jail. Emanuela's parents were actually quite relieved by this piece of news. This possibly meant their daughter was alive. This meant there was a chance they would be able to see her again, that she could return home safe and sound. But Alia Kat denied knowing anything about what the American was saying. Later on, he said that he knew Emanuela and another girl had been whisked off the streets while selling cosmetics. However, years later, he was actually released and in 2011, he gave an interview and stated that the Vatican had got him to attempt to try and kill the Pope and that Emanuela had been, was being kept as a prisoner by the Vatican in a monastery in Liechtenstein in Central Europe, where she had become a nun. The family could go and see her, but she could not leave the monastery. This man was telling a lot of different stories. The family did go to look for her in Liechtenstein and truly believed they would find her, as her brother Pietro reported during an interview, and it broke their heart when they came face to face with a girl who didn't even look anything like Emanuela. 
But let's go back to our timeline. The American kept calling the family and went as far as to play the recording of a girl's voice with a clear Roman accent, saying she was going to attend the third year of the Liceo Scientifico High School, which indeed Emanuela would have if she'd returned home. He also led to the discovery of the photocopies of some music sheets Emanuela would have been carrying on her at the time of her disappearance. The American had one request. He wanted to talk to the Vatican City Secretary of State. Apparently his request was met and he talked to him on the phone, though what they said has never been disclosed. It wasn't long before a number of organisations started claiming they had abducted Emanuela Orlandi to publicise their cause. The stake was too high, the people involved too powerful and the truth about what happened to this 15-year-old girl just got buried deeper and deeper. Also, the American was never heard from again and the case became cold and in 1997 the police ended the investigation into Manuela's disappearance. And that was basically it for a long time. However, in more recent years many details have surfaced showing the Vatican very probably knew more than they were letting on and Pietro, Emanuela's brother, strongly believes that the Pope himself knew what had happened to Emanuela but didn't reveal anything in order to protect the Vatican and the Catholic Church. Others claim the abduction of Emanuela was an attack on the Pope himself perpetrated by the same people who had commissioned Ali Agka with the murder of the Pope which had not been successful. But this time, it wasn't the Turkish terrorists, but East Germany's state security services, who confessed to having written letters to the Vatican pretending to be the Turkish terrorist organisation. Yes, and just to make things even more complicated, in 2005, the Italian TV show Chi l'ha visto, which is kind of like Crime Watch and has, over the years, helped to solve several cases, received an anonymous call by a man who claimed that the Banda della Magliana, a gang of criminals whose headquarters were in the Magliana district of Rome and which was active between the 70s and the 90s, were involved with Emanuela's disappearance. Go and check who is buried in the Basilica of Santa Polinare, the anonymous caller said, and ask about the favour Renatino did to Cardinal Poletti. Who was Renatino? Renatino was Enrico de Pedis, also known as Renatino, one of the bosses of the Roman criminal gang Banda della Magliana. And yes, he was buried in the Basilica of Santa Polinare. What was a renowned gangster's tomb doing in a Roman basilica where no one had been buried for over a century? Just a side note here, in Rome common people but also actors, writers, artists, authors and politicians are buried in one of the two large cemeteries, one inside Rome, Verano, one more towards the outskirts, Prima Porta. The TV programme Chi l'ha visto started their own investigation and managed to interview a former member of the criminal gang, Antonio Mancini, who said it was common knowledge the gang had had connections with the Vatican and had helped them take Emanuela Orlandi. That was the so-called favour Enrico de Pedis had done to Cardinal Poletti in exchange for money, surely, but also to be granted a burial spot inside the Roman Basilica of Santa Polinaire. A woman called Sabrina Minardi, who had been in a relationship with Enrico de Pedis, claimed she had been present at the abduction of Emanuela Orlandi, that Emanuela, who she picked up in a car at an agreed spot, had been kidnapped and drugged by members of the gang, that she remembers her laughing and crying at the same time, and her hair being cut in an absurd manner. According to Sabrina Minardi, she was driven in a dark BMW and was kept in an apartment for a while before being killed. In 2008, the journalist Antonio Parisi actually discovered the dark BMW, which had supposedly been used to abduct Emanuela, parked in the garage of Villa Borghese in the centre of Rome. Yet Minardi's testimonies tended to be very unreliable, as she claimed that her lover Enrico de Pedis had got rid of Emanuela's body by dumping it in a cement mixer in the seaside town of Torvajanica near Rome, at the same time as he got rid of that of an 11-year-old child who had been killed out of revenge, being the son of another gang member who had betrayed his trust. But this second murder happened 10 years after Emanuela Orlandi's disappearance and three years after Enrico de Pedis' actual death in 1990. So it doesn't sound very plausible. Also, Sabrina Minardi had a long history of drug addiction which may have made her memory foggy or she might have been looking for attention. It is pretty clear that the information she gave didn't help the police get any closer to resolving the case of Emanuela's disappearance.
It could be possible the Banda de la Magliana were involved as they had apparently invested money in the IOR, the Vatican Bank, which had subsequently crashed, losing them billions. And they probably thought they could blackmail the Vatican into getting part of their money back. But why take Emmanuel Orlandi? Why not take someone higher up? And why was, as far as we know, a ransom never requested? Why was Emanuela, nor her remains, ever found? There is definitely no way we can say this is the answer to what's happened to the missing girl, simply because all we have are a lot of speculation, contradictions and, above all, no proof. In 2013, the TV show Chi l'ha visto received a call from a filmmaker called Marco Accetti. Accetti led to the finding of a flute, which he claimed was the flute Emanuela had been carrying when she disappeared. Accetti claimed, as the member of a left-wing organisation, he had been involved with the abduction of Emanuela to target the Vatican. I won't go more in depth into this, as it would just open up further speculations and it would take forever to analyse everything in this case, as I said at the beginning of the video. Pietro Orlandi, Emanuela's brother, confirmed that the flute did look a lot like his sister's one, but DNA tests on the object were inconclusive, so we still don't know whether the flute belonged to Emanuela or not. And to be quite honest, it wouldn't have been too hard to get your hands on one who looked just like it. By then, everyone knew she had been carrying said flute and also what it looked like. The last tip the police got was in 2019, so just about a year ago. This tip said to look for Emanuela's remains in the Teutonic Cemetery, Cimitero Teutonico, right next to the Vatican. This is a burial site reserved for members of the Confraternity of Our Lady of the German Cemetery, which owns the cemetery and no one is really allowed in sight. The Orlandi family wanted to follow this lead and request for the tombs that had been singled out by the tipper to be opened up. These were allegedly the tombs of two princesses. The Orlandi's request was granted and the tombs were opened up, but there was no trace of Emanuela's remains in sight and, absurdly enough, neither were there traces of the two princesses. A few years ago, I happened to read a book by Marco Parisi and, sorry, Max Parisi, I think, and Otello Lupacchini, whose title would translate into English as Twelve Women, One Killer, according to which Emanuela Orlandi, as well as 11 other women who lived in and around Rome in the same period, were all victims of a serial killer who was active in the area at the time. This might sound really far-fetched, but what they show as proof and the investigation carried out by the authors such as the killer having used the story of the stint selling Avon Cosmetics to lure the girls, as well as a green BMW and undeniable connections between all of the victims, really makes one think whether the fact that Emanuela was a Vatican citizen was just pure coincidence and the truth got buried under the avalanche of false claims that came from the fact that now anyone could use this against the Vatican and the Pope to get something, whether it be physical, such as money, or political. I believe we will never know what happened to Emanuela. Many think she's still alive somewhere, but I wonder if she is, why did she never get in touch? Would anyone really keep someone hostage for almost 40 years? Emanuela's brother Pietro refuses to give up the battle and hope, and to this day it remains active in searching for her lost sister. Today I've only barely scraped the surface of this incredible mystery. There are so many sources and so much information, it is really hard to compile it all into one video. However, if you enjoyed this and would like to join me on this art and crime series, I will be posting uh, weekly videos about Italian crimes at least until Halloween. And if you would like to join me, then please uh, give this video a thumbs up as that will boost my channel, subscribe and if you hit the notification bell, uh, it will let you know when I upload my next video. See you soon. Bye for now.